Now we are turning in the New Testament scriptures to Paul's letter to the Colossians. We are engaged in a series of nine studies, as you will see from the order of service under this general title, Nine Essential Keys to the Christian Life. And we come to the penultimate study, which is entitled Recognizing What's New. And we're going to read this evening in Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Paul has been speaking to the Colossians about the transformation that has taken place in their lives. Verse 9, you have taken off your old man with his practices. You have put on the new man who is being renewed in the knowledge in the, being renewed in knowledge of the Im, in the image of his creator and now he goes on here there is no greek or jew circumcised or uncircumcised barbarian scythian slave or free but christ is all and is in you all therefore as god's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We saw last time how Paul has been urging these Christians to put off the clothing of the old life, of the old age. And now he's urging them to put on clothing that is appropriate to their new existence as Christians. Clothing that illustrates what it means to belong to Jesus Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In my odd moments, and they have been relatively odd and sparse in the course of this last week, I've been dabbling once again, as I love to do, in the writings of the early Christian fathers. That is, Christians who lived not at the time in which Paul was writing, but in the 150 years or so after Paul wrote, after the message of the gospel first began to be carried throughout the ancient world. And a very interesting thing happened in the first two centuries of the Christian era. In those early years after the death of the apostles, as you read the writings of Christians, you become very conscious that they are very much a persecuted minority. And yet within a hundred years, you find writers like the famous Tertullian, not only writing about the success of the Christian gospel, but challenging the emperor, for example, as he writes to the emperor, challenging the emperor with this thought, if you were to remove the Christians from your empire, as you want to do, you would discover that your empire would collapse. Christians have taken over the empire. In every corner of your empire, he writes, there are those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. It so happens they are your very best citizens. But, emperor, open your eyes and see that a new race of men has emerged. That a third race of men and women has emerged, and they are called Christians, and they are the ones who are triumphing in your empire. And if you were to ask the question, what was it that caused such an extraordinary revolution within a hundred years or so of the Apostle Paul writing, 
the most important answer would be this. Not that there were great preachers in the first two centuries, although there certainly were. But the effect of the preaching of the gospel on the lives of men and women was so dramatic that it became obvious to the ancient world that this was a different race of people altogether. That these were a different nation. That this was a new people who had suddenly arisen in the ancient world. And they had all the distinguishing characteristics of a new people. They thought in a different way. They lived in a different way. They spoke in a different way. They loved different things. And the impact of this radically new culture that had been created by the power of the Christian gospel was such that in a spiritually desolate world it was attracting more and more men and women to the feet of Jesus Christ to trust in him. The single greatest impact that was made on the early Christian world was the impact of the revolutionized lives of the people of God. Because it became immediately obvious to men and women in the ancient world that there was nowhere else in the ancient world that they could find this kind of thing, that they could see this kind of of transformation. It is, as a matter of fact, the very things that the Apostle Paul is speaking about here that we were studying together last Sunday evening. It is these very things expressed in the lives of Christian people that revolutionized the ancient world. And it's a very interesting and important thing for us to notice that these things were characteristic or to be characteristic of the Christians in Colossae, not merely as isolated individuals, but as a community, as a people. It was the power of what they were as the people of God that revolutionized the ancient world and made the Christian gospel so attractive to needy men and women. And it's about this that I want us to think a little this evening for a very important reason. And that is that I'm absolutely convinced we have lost our sense of the witnessing power of the community of God's people. And Paul, as we have seen from time to time here, when he addresses the Christians at Colossae, does not address them as isolated individuals. His use of the second person, you, is always the second person plural, because Paul doesn't happen to believe in isolated Christians. He believes that Christians isolated from the community of God's people thereby render themselves relatively powerless in the impact they're able to have upon the world in which they live. And because the Christian community is an entirely different kind of community with this new race of men and women, the Apostle Paul is concerned as he speaks to the Colossians about their new lifestyle to put that new lifestyle within the central context of that lifestyle being lived out in a community the likes of which men and women will never see anywhere else. And that's why it's important for us as we study this so significant passage to notice that Paul's whole appeal here in verses 12 to 17 is based on the principle that he is speaking to God's people. It is as God's people, he says. Not as God's individuals, but as God's people. 
that these things are to be true of us. But what kind of people does the Apostle Paul believe Christians have become? Well, there are several things in this section that help us to understand what he's saying. The first and the most obvious is that for the Apostle Paul, Christians are God's chosen people. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Elsewhere, for example, in the twin letter to the Ephesians that contains much similar teaching to Colossians, elsewhere when Paul speaks about God's choice, he traces that choice back through history into the mists of God's eternal love. Here, he is not so much interested in the ultimate origin of God's choice as he is interested in the immediate effects of God's choice. What are the immediate effects in our lives that God has chosen as Christians as his people just as he chose Israel as his people in Old Testament days? The immediate effects of that are, he says, twofold. Number one, that we are a holy people, and number two, that we are a dearly loved people. What does he mean when he says that as Christians, as the chosen people, we are first of all holy? The word holy in both testaments of the Bible is a word that conveys an idea of spatial separation of taking something from one location, separating it from where it used to belong, and putting it in another location. And sometimes it also carries the idea not only of putting it in a separate location, but of reserving it for a special use. When in the Old Testament God spoke of his people as a holy people, as a holy nation, separated for himself. That actually was physically true. He quite literally, physically removed them from one geographical location in Egypt and brought them through their 40 years of wandering in the desert to a totally different location in the land of Canaan. And not only so, but he said to them, because I have separated you from Egypt and placed you in Canaan, I have, as it were, put over you a reserved sticker that says, these are my special people. They are reserved for my special use. And everything we discover in the Old Testament, the ceremonies, the way in which God's law was applied to his people in a very particular way, All of this was to signal to the nations around them not only that God had separated them from Egypt, but they were a special people living in a special way, that they were different from all the other nations. It wasn't that God had chosen them because they were different, as though he had said, I see that nation, that nation is different from other nations. I'll choose them. No, the Old Testament prophets were constantly saying. It wasn't because of anything in you. It was because God in His grace decided to separate you from your bondage, to free you from Egypt, to show His mighty power, and to place you in this land that He gave you these laws, these commandments that made the whole world look at Canaan, and look particularly at Jerusalem, and say, these are God's chosen people. In other words, the apostle is saying, the evidence that one has been chosen by God is that one's life breathes the spirit of belonging to God. That everything about me indicates that I no longer belong to this world. I belong to the God who made this world. I am one 
of his chosen people. And that, says the apostle, goes hand in hand quite beautifully with another principle. Not only the sense that we have been separated and reserved for God, but that because God has separated us for himself, he has separated us for himself because he loves us dearly. You are, he says, his dearly loved. I wonder if it's significant that this is the same language that the New Testament actually uses about the Lord Jesus. Because it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we have come to be separated for God. What God could say about His only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, He is also able to say about all those who are Jesus' people. We share in the love that the Heavenly Father has for His only Son. He has demonstrated His love for us, says Paul in Romans 5, in that while we were still sinners, His only Son died for us. You look at the cross and what do you conclude? You conclude that if God is prepared to do that for me, how much He must love me. If God is prepared to allow His Son to suffer for me, it almost raises the question of whether He loves me more than He loves His Son. And it is this privilege, says the Apostle Paul, that is characteristic of the people of God. And that's a beautiful balance, isn't it? It's a beautiful balance that Paul is calling upon these Colossians to see expressed in their lives a sense of holy separation from the world that makes everybody who knows us realize we are not part of the world. We don't belong to the club. We are different. We are unusual. We are aliens, the New Testament says. And yet at the same time, we breathe a poise and a confidence, a sense of belonging, a sense of being loved that men and women who don't know Christ can never possibly experience. It is a magnificent balance that is a total puzzle to the non-Christian. How can somebody who is so radically different and seems to me to be walking in a narrow way possibly exude this sense of being overwhelmed by the love of God in Jesus Christ? And it is this, this strange combination that cannot be found in anything the world can give or create. No natural parent can put this into his son or daughter or her son or daughter. It is this, this characteristic that so obviously belongs to another world altogether, breathes another kind of life altogether. It's this that draws men and women to see that there is in the community of God's people the sense of the presence of of God's power. The church consists of God's chosen people. But the community also consists, you'll notice, in the second place, and Paul touches on this in different ways, the community consists not only of chosen people, but of united people. Verse 15, another exhortation. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Now this is perhaps one of the more misunderstood statements in this passage. Let me take a moment to explain what Paul is not saying. We sometimes say about things that we're going to do, I couldn't do it because I didn't have any sense of peace and I need to let the peace of Christ rule in my heart as I'm guided to serve him. Now, that may be an important principle, but it's not the principle that Paul's teaching us here. 
What he is saying here is this. He is saying, in your relationships with one another, in your relationships with one another, the well-being of the Christian community, the ultimate well-being of others, must be the principle that governs your behavior. The word he uses here, let the peace of Christ rule, conveys the idea of the peace of Christ acting as an umpire as you toss around in your head what am I going to do how am I going to respond Paul is saying the principle that ought to guide your response is what is ultimately going to be for the well-being of Christ's church it is in the light of that sense of the blessing that we long for for God's people in order that God's people may shine as lights in a dark place. It is that principle that governs our decisions, governs our behavior patterns. It is the well-being of others, not the well-being of myself or my position, but the well-being of the whole community. And why is this so important? It is because you were called to this as members of, of one body or to put it another way around because you are members of one body you behave in a way you respond to each other in a way that exhibits the fact that you belong together now that's a tremendously important principle for Paul one of the great pictures of the Christian church in the New Testament is the picture of the church as the body of Christ. And one of the interesting things about that picture is this. The only person in the New Testament who uses it is the Apostle Paul. There is no other New Testament writer who speaks about the church as the body of Christ. Only Paul does. But he does it very frequently. And nowhere more significantly, of course, than in what he says to the almost dismembered church in Corinth. And I want you to turn with me just for a moment in order that we may flush out what Paul is thinking about here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and to verse 12. And let's take a few minutes to run down some of the things that Paul obviously has in mind when he writes to the Colossians and says, you are one body in Christ, so behave as a united body. He says the body is a unit, although it's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. Now there's his basic principle. We are one in Christ, but we are different in Christ. We don't all have the same function. And precisely because we have different functions, we depend upon each other in order that the body of Christ may function properly. We are one in the body of Christ, verse 13, because we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Then he's back to the same point. The body is not made up of one part, but of many. And all of these parts depend on all of the other parts. To translate that into our life together, I depend upon you and you depend upon me. And we all depend in one way upon each other. Otherwise, we become a malformed body of Jesus Christ. And our church communicates to the world not the glorious saving Christ, but some malformed, unattractive Christ. And he gives an illustration he lets the body begin to talk to itself. He says, if the foot should begin to speak and say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. You're sometimes tempted to say that. Because I don't have this function in the fellowship, I don't have any function. People do behave like that, don't they? Don't they really? If I can't get to do that, I'm not going to do anything. No, he says. 
What would you look like physically if you behaved like that? If your foot said, I want to be a hand, and if I can't be a hand, I'm not going to walk, then you would spend your life hobbling around on one leg. You would look foolish. A man who has two legs but hops through life. He wouldn't be peculiar in the old-fashioned biblical sense. He would be peculiar in any possible sense. He would be strange and entirely unattractive. People would point at him and say, what a strange fellow. Well, says Paul, none of this nonsense. Because the foot says, I'm not a hand, it doesn't cease to belong to the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't for that reason cease to be part of the body. And then he turns it round brilliantly. You think the Apostle Paul didn't have a sense of humor? Listen to this. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? It's as though Paul is saying, There are these parts of the body saying, I want to be an eye. I don't want to be a hand. I don't want to be a foot. I don't want to be an ear. I want to be an eye. And he says, well, be an eye. What do you end up with? You end up with an eye. In both senses of the word, don't you? That's what you end up with. Oh, he says to these Corinthians, look, if you get the message from the illustration of a human body, can't you get the message I'm trying to communicate to you about the body of Christ? In fact, he says, look at this, if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Don't you think he's loving this? Don't you think there's a smile playing on his lips as he says these things? As though he's saying to himself, How ludicrous can we Christians get if the whole body were an ear? If everybody wants to be an ear, we'd lose our sense of smell. But in fact, listen to this, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Don't you see the beauty of the way God has put us together in the church fellowship, he's saying? If we were all preachers, there would be no listeners. It works the other way around. If we were all listeners, there would be no preachers. If we were all hands, there would be no ears. None of us has all of the gifts that we need to be the body of Christ. We all depend on each other's gifts. So, he says, verse 21, the eye can't say to the hand, off with you, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, listen to the beauty of this. Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we actually treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. Not only do we depend upon each other, he says, but just as it's the genius of the way we live our lives and our bodies, it's the genius of the life of the Christian church, that where there is weakness, where there is need, there is special honor bestowed. There is special care drawn out from the hearts of God's people to give special honor to those who think of themselves as least and lowest. Now he says, verse 27, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We are a chosen people, and we are, by God's grace, a united people. And I'll give you one special reason Paul mentions in these verses for seeing this as of great importance. Do you notice what he says at the end of verse 11 when he addresses them and says, look, because we are one in Christ Jesus, don't you be dragging into the fellowship of the church your hoity-toity Greek background, the fact that you're well-educated, or the fact that you were a Jew, or the fact that you weren't a Jew, 
or that you came from this part of town or that you went to this school or that you've got this in your past or that in your past. None of this, he says, for this reason. Because Christ is in you all. That's the key that binds together the body of Jesus Christ and makes it such an offense when I refuse to welcome another member of the body of Jesus Christ and embrace him or her in the bonds of fellowship. When I keep someone at arm's length, what am I doing? I'm really saying to the Lord Jesus Christ who has brought us together, you may dwell in them, but I'm not prepared to dwell with them. You know what that means, don't you? It means that it doesn't really matter to you what Jesus thinks of another Christian. And you see, when we grasp that, when we grasp that, when we are drawn in our fellowship together, and this is the genius of what Paul's saying, when we are drawn in our fellowship together to treat each other, to love each other as individuals in whom Jesus Christ dwells, we are drawn instinctively to the things that bind us together and not the things that separate us. That is why, my friends, it is such an offense to our Lord Jesus Christ and to the church of Jesus Christ whenever a fellow believer's name is mentioned and the first thing that rushes out of our lips is a word of criticism and distance instead of a word of thanksgiving and fellowship. The knowledge that Christ indwells his people and makes them one in the power of his Spirit is the clue to understanding the privilege of belonging to the chosen and the united people of God. But there's a third thing that makes the people of God so distinctive. First, that they are chosen and therefore holy and dearly loved. Second, that they are united because they are members of one body and indwelt by one and the same Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, the people of God is distinguished from all other people because the people of God are a Christ-centered people. If you run your eye down through this passage, you'll notice how this is so for Paul. For example, in verse 13, we are God's people because the Lord has forgiven us. He has removed every obstacle to our fellowship with him. We are forgiven by Christ. Verse 15, we are ruled by the peace of Christ. Verse 16, we are indwelt by the word of Christ. Verse 17, we are those who do everything in the name of Christ. And again, you notice that he had told us this in summary form even before he began the exposition by saying in verse 11, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all. And it's as simple as that. Wherever Christ is all to people, that people is united. That people breathes the grace of Christ in a way the world can neither understand nor provide where Christ is all. That would be the solvent of many, many, many situations in church life, wouldn't it? Is Christ going to be all to you and to me and it would transform Christian fellowships in such a way that the world would be bound to see the presence and the power of God. 
if you're at all familiar with the last extended prayer of the Lord Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 17, you'll realize that Paul is teaching these Colossian Christians to become what Jesus prayed all of his people would be, united in him as he is united with his Father in order that the world might believe that the Father sent the Son to be its Savior. I think I can put it like this. How is the world ever going to believe that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior if the church that professes to be saved by that Savior behaves in a very unsaved fashion? But where the church manifests the power of this salvation in the community of God's people, it's there that the power of our fellowship together expresses mighty witness to the world. Someone said to me recently that they had brought along somebody to a Christian occasion and that person turned to them and said to them that they, they just didn't know that this kind of thing happened. That's the power of Christian fellowship. And if that power is to be released, then we need to respond humbly and with faith to this great challenge. We have the privilege of being God's chosen people We have been made God's united people. We are called to be Christ-centered people. Can you put your hand on your heart tonight and say, Christ is all. Christ is all. If we were all able to do that, it wouldn't be long before the world would believe that the Father had sent the Son to be the Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what privileges you've poured out upon us. You have lavished honor upon our lives. You have poured into our experience this amazing privilege of being brought into one body together to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we seek to live and fellowship and witness together, that Jesus Christ may become visible among us and the power of his visible presence may draw others to believe in his name. We pray this for his great name's sake.